Do I make it just after 10? So let, let's begin. Um, so good morning, everybody. Um, um, welcome to everybody who's already joined. Um, and really great to see so many of you here, more people joining um, as I'm talking. Um, what we're looking at today is contract management under the Procurement Act 2023. And I think this is an area where um, the Act is really heading into new territory um, with its reach into the contract management phase. And of course, the um, extensive new transparency obligations around this. Um, we did look at contract changes um, in our last webinar, so we're not looking at that today. But um, if you missed that one, um, you can always find it on our Procurement Portal webinars page. If you just go to www.procurementportal.com, um, you, you'll find a, a, a section on the webinars there. Um, just thinking about contract management, I think complying with the contract management aspects of the Act um, is likely to require a lot more joined up thinking between procurement and contract management teams. Um, and as I think we'll see in the webinar today, um, it does have the potential to create significant tensions between um, uh, authorities and suppliers. Um, I think it's fair to say that it might be even be an area where we see um, increased procurement challenges developing. Um, but on the other hand, it is likely to make it much easier for um, authorities and suppliers to see which contracts are being performed poorly and by whom, and even to exclude those suppliers who are falling short. And that would be to the advantage of highly performing suppliers and no doubt also in the public benefit. Um, so a few quick introductions. I'm Jenny Boris jones Senior Legal Advisor, Procurement Specialist here. Um, and I'm also here today with Adam, um, Adam Hume, who um, is a Senior Associate in our Manchester office. He specialises in procurement and commercial contracts. He was a lawyer at um, Transport for Greater Manchester before he joined us, so lots of experience of large projects. And also Claire Crawford. Um, Claire's a partner who leads our contentious procurement team and she advises public bodies and suppliers alike on everything to do with procurement disputes from early stages right through to claims in the High Court um, and, and settlements. And So it's great to have them both here today. Um, just looking at housekeeping, um, we've still got a few people joining. Um, we are recording this and we'll send a, a recording round afterwards. Um, if you've got technical difficulties or issues, pop a note in the Q&A box. Uh, Sarah will help you. Um, we don't take questions during the webinar, but we do welcome you to put your questions in the Q&A um, uh, uh, section and um, what we usually do is come back to you with a sort of Q&A document that we send around with the slides, the recording, um, so all of that will be coming around um, uh, afterwards. And also at the end of the webinar um, we, um, we do have a feedback form and as always really grateful if you can, um, if you can complete that. Um, so just in terms of um, reform, um, there has just been some uh, an announcement on the um, uh, the Parliament website, um, a statement by the um, Minister for the Cabinet Office of a um, delay to implementation. So um, implementation is now 24th of February 2025. Um, and if you go to the Parliament website, you can see that set out in the um, written statements for today. Um, just to give you a bit of a sense of the timeline, some of the things that we're still expecting, um, we are looking still for the final bits of guidance, um, particularly around central digital platform, the publication of information, electronic invoicing, payments compliance notices, and also the covered procurement objectives. Um, we're also expecting a review and update of um, PPNs to align them with the Act. Um, and also, um, uh, templates um, by the end of it, September we're expecting to see some really helpful templates and tools being issued by government um, and just have a look at um, what those might be. Um, if you've been following the government's um, Communities of Practice Forum on the um, Government Commercial College site, um, there has been some information put out about the standard templates that the government's expecting to publish at the end of September. Um, I won't go through all of them on the slide there, um, but as you can see, there's some really useful um, materials on there. So for example, uh, template assessment summaries, competitive, competitive flexible procedure procurement packs, um, uh, and all sorts of um, other helpful documents. So it'd be really useful to be able to see those. Um, 
further templates potentially under consideration, um, a couple of those really relevant to the um, subject matter of this webinar, so KPI trackers, for example, and a contract handover and management pack. Um, these are things that the, 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 that the government is um, aspiring to produce, not finalised as yet, but obviously we'll be, we'll be looking out for those. Um, and also, I think towards the end of September, uh, something called a commercial pathway tool, which I think would be some sort of online tool um, helping authorities manage the end-to-end -end commercial life cycle. Um, and it will be broken down into those four phases in the same way that the guidance is um, plan, define, procure and manage, which is quite a helpful way of dividing up the act in your mind, uh, making it a bit more manageable to understand. Um, and I wanted to highlight um, um, just that we will be doing some um, in-person events. I think my colleague Sarah will put a note in the Q&A with how you can um, sign up for those um, at some point during, during the webinar. Um, so um, if you're interested in talking about um, the guidance and the templates and all the latest um, releases, um, you could think about joining us at those events. So looking at our first question today, what we were going to talk about was certain notice requirements into contract management provisions, um, which were to have a delayed implementation. But I think that that has been superseded really um, by the um, statement on the Parliament website this morning um, of uh, a delay um, to the implementation of the, the whole Act. So we were looking at 28th of October, 2024. Um, that's now delayed to 24th of February. Um, and obviously we've had very little time to look at that statement, but it looks like one of the things the new government is wanting to do is to revisit and redraft the National Procurement Policy Statement, um, uh, which is the reason given for, for delay. Um, so no doubt there'll be lots of um, uh, discussion about that in the procurement world today. I don't think it was entirely unexpected. Um, and I think given all those useful templates and resources, which we were just talking about, um, I think many authorities will um, be quite relieved to have a bit more time to be able to um, digest those and see how they can be incorporated into their own um, resources. Um, I suppose for those who, authorities who were planning to get started on a Procurement Act 2023 procurement sort of shortly after 28th of October, um, they um, presumably will find that they will have to revisit that procurement strategy, um, given that the current regime, um, we presume, will, will apply to um, right up until um, 24th of February. So the current regime is going to apply to all procurements commenced um, before 24th of February 2025. Um, so that's what I was going to, that's what I'll say on um, implementation for now. Um, and there may be more news about that um, in, in due course. But moving on to the second question, um, which is about setting KPIs. Um, that's one that I'm also going to look at today. Um, so if you are a central government authority, um, you'll probably already be familiar with those central government policy requirements to set and report on KPIs um, in larger contracts according to a stated ratings regime. And of course, what's new in the Procurement Act is the extension of that obligation to all contracting authorities um, where the contract value is over five million. And I think there has been some confusion around KPIs. How many KPIs do you need to set? Um, do you need to publish all of them? Do you only need to publish some of them? What do you need to report on? And, and that sort of confusion is understandable in a sense because you have the primary obligations set out in the Act. You then have the procurement regulations which set out further detail and nuances about, about what you need to do. And, and then we also have the guidance as well. So what I thought might be quite helpful in terms of breaking it down as an approach to thinking about it is to divide it up into three areas. Um, setting, publishing, and then reporting on KPIs, and to think of those really as three different activities with different requirements. So let's have a look at those now. 
So in terms of setting KPIs, we're looking at section 52 of the Act, and um, that tells us what a KPI is uh, in, in, in the eyes of the Act, and it is a measure against which supplier performance can be assessed throughout the lifetime of the contract. Uh, and it says that where your contract is valued, uh, your public contract is valued at over 5 million, um, authorities must set at least three KPIs. Um, the requirement doesn't apply if it's a light touch concession, utilities or a framework agreement. So it will apply to cool off contracts, but not to the framework agreement itself. Um, and I'll just mention, I think Adam will talk a bit more about this later, but in the setting of KPIs, there is a role for preliminary market engagement and seeing what KPIs might be suitable. Um, if you look at the detailed requirements um, in, in, in relation to tender notices, contract notices, um, there's nothing expressly saying that you must list out the KPIs in the tender notice, but you do have to publish all the associated tender documents uh, including the draft contract. And so I think that does mean that the KPI regime will need to be thought about upfront. It's not something you can sort of start to look at um, well into the procurement process. So that's the, that's the sort of material obligation around the actual setting of KPIs. Then turning to the obligations to publish these, and we're looking at section 53 and regulation 32, which effectively develops and, and provides more detail for section 53. So section 53.2 um, requires the publication of all KPIs set and set and contract. And the guidance tells us that um, because our contract will be valued at over 5 million, this publish, publication requirement um, will be satisfied by meeting the 53.3 obligation to publish the contract as a whole. Um, so that obligation requires not only a contract details notice, but where the contract is over 5 million, you must also publish a copy of the contract. Um, and then as ever with the Procurement Act, we look to the regulations for more detail. So regulation 32.2R says that our contract details notice must include a description of the three most material KPIs at the time that we're publishing that contract details notice. And also we must state how often the authority is intending to assess performance under section 71.2. So that's what we need to do in terms of the actual publication of the KPIs. And then finally, the third strand, I guess, is the reporting and that's section 71 and further developed in regulation 39.4. So we must report at least annually, although we can do so more often, and also upon termination um, via a contract performance notice. And we must use the ratings that are set out in Regulation 39.5. Um, and I've sort of pasted those into the right-hand side of the slide there. Um, and it does say that um, the re report should be made um, against the three KPIs which the authority thinks is most material at the time the contract performance notice is published. Um, and there is confirmation in the guidance that these may well be different um, to those chosen to be detailed in the contract details notice, for example. So an example there might be a long contract um, at the start, those um, KPIs around transition might be most relevant. Um, but if let's say it's, it, it, it's a big IT contract at the end of the contract, KPIs around user satisfaction might be um, more relevant, for example. So hopefully that sort of sheds a little bit of a light on the sort of KPI regime, what you have to do in relation to setting, publishing, reporting. And I'm going to turn now to, um, to Adam, um, if I can, and he's going to um, talk about some practical issues in the authority supplier relationship in relation to KPIs. Thanks, Adam. Hey, thanks, Jenny. Hello, everybody. So as Jenny just mentioned, um, KPIs are broadly defined in section 52.4 of the Procurement Act as a factor or measure against which a supplier's performance of a contract can be assessed during the life cycle of it. Now, applying the above definition in context, certainly during the operational phase of contracts, we routinely see authorities describe service levels to determine standard performance that is expected from a supplier, with service credits being applied if service, credits are not met, if service levels are not met. But it's worth noting that requirements for a supplier to achieve milestones by milestone dates in an implementation plan 
could also be caught by the definition, which means that the implementation phase of the contract could also now be caught by the legislative regime. Now, as the definition is widely um, drafted, and irrespective of whether the performance measure is described at service level, a standard of service, or a KPI, and also irrespective of whether any service credits can be recovered by the authority, all these descriptions will be caught. And this is relevant to the authority's assessment of which KPIs are most important to refer to in a contract details notice, which is something that Jenny has just referred to. So looking at other practical aspects, so given the much greater transparency on performance against KPIs that are now set, it's in the interest of both the authority and the supplier to ensure the KPIs are realistic and achievable. Authorities will still want to ensure that KPIs are sufficiently robust and will wish to avoid a scenario where a KPI is too soft. For example, attend performance review meetings on a quarterly basis, as this may not meet the legislative requirements. Suppliers will be keen to avoid the consequences of a contract performance notice, showing that they are not performing against KPIs as expected, this especially given the linkage of this to discretionary exclusion grounds, which is to be discussed shortly. We would therefore suggest that an open and frank discussion take place with suppliers as part of pre-market engagement, so that the expectations of the authority are made clear from the outset, but with reasonable and sensible suggestions being made by the supply market to inform the structure and the content of the KPIs, which are to apply when the contract is issued to the market for paid or negotiation purposes. We would recommend that KPIs are clear and go to the heart of the main areas that could impact on performance. Typically, we would expect to focus on KPIs related to quality and availability and suppliers' responses to incidents that impact service delivery. As part of pre-market engagement, authorities will need to have in mind a series of commercial red lines, which will help to inform how robust the KPI should be. As part of a negotiated procedure, authorities will need to ensure that these red lines are not compromised. We would suggest that compliance with KPIs could be encouraged by effective contract management and building good relationships with the supplier from the outset. To this end, both authorities and suppliers may consider it would be worth establishing dedicated contract management teams to ensure ongoing and effective monitoring of contracts as a whole, but in particular in relation to the KPI element. A dedicated team of contract managers working in tandem with the relevant project teams may help with ensuring that the output of the relevant contract is delivered efficiently and effectively over time. Linked to the above, the contract management provisions within contracts will likely need careful review to ensure that the arrangements proposed will be suitable for service delivery and the achievement of the KPIs. This is another area that could be covered by pre-market engagement. Now, some suppliers may take the view they will not bid for work where KPIs have been set or where KPIs are suggested will be difficult for suppliers to achieve. Suppliers that do provide bids will likely do so with one eye on compliance with the KPIs, but at the risk this may end up being priced into bids, perhaps to accommodate the supplier establishing a dedicated contract management function. Just to note, in the world of IT contracts, suppliers have service level agreements with different standard offers and they have the opportunity to differentiate themselves on the basis um, of what these service levels offer. That opportunity may be diminished when the KPIs are set by the authority. But this, again, is something where free market engagement could be helpful. Um, so overall, the proposed regime does give authorities a level of influence not held previously, but meaningful compliance will likely be increased only with the engagement by both authorities and suppliers. So I'll hand back to Jenny for the next section. Thanks, Adam. That, that's great. So the next thing we were looking at is um, uh, exclusion for breach um, and exclusion for unremitted poor performance and some of the commercial issues that that that, that engages. And, and when we were thinking about this topic, we were thinking it's not really possible to discuss contract management, which, of course, at the bottom is the management of a relationship between the authority and the supplier in the context of a contract. Um, you can't really think about that without thinking about these new obligations on the authority to report poor performance and breach and, and to think about the significant imp implications that that could have for the supplier and the potential knock-on effects um, on the relationship between the supplier and the authority. So I think what we'll do is I talk a little bit about the new rules um, and then Adam um, will give us some thoughts on how it might look in practice. So looking at exclusion for breach and poor performance. So two separate things here. First of all, a supplier breach, which leads to termination of partial termination and a of damages or settlement, or um, unremitted supplier performance. Um, so this is where um, 
the contract is not being performed to the satisfaction of the authority. The authority has told the supplier that it needs to improve its performance um, and that that hasn't happened. Um, and it's noticed that this is sort of separate in a way, but could be linked to the KPI reporting. Um, it, it, it sort of stands to reason that the poor performance may also um, show up in the KPI reporting, but it might not necessarily be the case. Um, the poor performance could be in relation to some sort of different area. So if either of these things have happened, then um, there's an obligation on the authority, and, and it is an obligation, not a discretion, to um, report this um, via a contract performance notice under Section 71.5. Um, so the contract's performance notice has two functions. One is the regular reporting on KPIs, and the other is reporting on poor performance. So this um, type of um, Section 71.5 report um, is uh, really significant in terms of its impact on the supplier because it's a discretionary exclusion ground and it renders the supplier an excludable supplier. If you're an excludable supplier, this triggers the Section 78 right for any authority to terminate a public contract that the supplier is delivering. And it also means that in future procurements, um, when it's um, filling in its supplier information service selection type information, it must tick a box to declare that it is a, um, an excludable supplier. Um, and that new authority in that new um, procurement may then have to make the decision as to whether it allows that supplier to participate or not. Um, the supplier does have to be given an opportunity to self-clean, but, but ultimately it's in the authority's discretion um, to decide whether the self-cleaning evidence is, is sufficient or not. So um, it's a very precarious position for suppliers to be in. Um, made even more so by the fact that if an authority does decide to um, exclude a supplier, um, it's obliged to refer that exclusion to the debarment review service, which is a part of the procurement review, review unit. Um, that's certainly not to say that um, every exclusion is going to lead to debarment. Very far from it. Um, but there are many steps in between the referral and an actual debarment. Um, but nonetheless, you know, you can understand that suppliers would be feeling pretty nervous. And, and I think in a, in a sense, in the real world of complex contracts, um, it, it, it's not always black and white um, whose fault the poor performance is. And, and often, you know, both parties may have played a role in it. How does that fit together with the Section 71.5 notice, which um, is, um, uh, you know, sort of more, more black and white? And I'll turn to Adam, who um, is going to offer some, a, a few more thoughts on the commercial impact of one of these notices. Thanks again, Jenny. So although the regime is intending to encourage performance from suppliers that authorities are paying for, issuing a contract performance notice makes the supplier excludable and also creates a reputational risk because of the public record of the supplier's poor performance. And this is without considering the implied termination grounds in Section 78.1 of the Act. As such, as such, excuse me, suppliers may try to preempt the issue of a contract performance notice by seeking legal redress within the 30-day period during which an authority is to issue such a notice, especially where the supplier considers that its performance has been acceptable. This possibility is heightened by the fact that authorities do not have a choice as to whether a contract performance notice is issued. The language in Section 71.5 states that the authority must publish where there is failure to perform, and authorities will wish to publish to support any future claim for breach of contract. This regime will also place greater emphasis on authorities being able to comply with their own obligations so as not to contribute to the supply breach. Even where the notice is issued, the risk of challenge from a supplier subsists, especially in relation to whether the content of the notice is correct and whether it is compliant with the regulations. It's also highly likely that a supplier's common law rights are not affected. Therefore, although authorities will have scope to compel performance from suppliers under the new regime, suppliers will still have meaningful influence. It remains to be seen how this will play out in practice. But given the lengthy processes that apply to procurements, the risks highlighted here, and the effort that will have been expended by both the authority and the supplier in respect of the award of the contract, it is likely that the instinct of both parties in the case of poor performance will be to try and make the contract work rather than having to issue a contract performance notice. When combined with the reference in Section 71.4 of the Act, that supplier must be given every opportunity to improve its performance 
it can be inferred that processes such as requiring a supplier to submit a remediation plan for the authority's approval, which then the supplier has to comply with before a termination ground under the contract arises, would be an effective tool to both manage and improve performance, but also assist in ensuring that the working relationship between the authority and the supplier is supported until such time as it is clear that the supplier cannot meet the relevant KPIs, which would be evident when a supplier is not able to comply with a remediation plan. Both parties will have a vested interest in ensuring the remediation plan process is effective. So the structure of the remediation plan and what is expected from it should be set out in the contract at the outset. And to mitigate the risk of remediation plan um, not addressing the issue in practice, additional detail on the drafting will be key to ensure that the scope of the remediation plan addresses the root cause of relevant breach. And this links back to the contract management point referred to previously, as the likelihood of having to rely on a remediation plan is reduced if the contract is managed as effectively as possible from the outset. Okay, um, handing back to Jennifer for our final section. Thanks, Adam. That, that's great. So what we're going to do now is ask Claire, who's our contentious procurement lead, um, to give us a bit of a litigator's view of some questions that come up around termination and settlement. Thanks, Claire. Thanks very much, Jenny, and morning, everyone. Um, so just in a in respect of a bit of context setting, we, we you're probably aware that all contracting authorities must publish a contract termination notice following termination of any public contract. And for the purposes um, of, of the transparency requirements, generally the Act defines termination as encompassing all circumstances in which a contract might come to an end. So in terms of the provisions that we need to look at in terms of contract termination notices, Section 80 of the Act and Regulation 41 of the regulations set out the provisions relating to contract termination notices and the detail that needs to be included within them. Um, Section 80 of the Act also confirms that a contract termination notice needs to be published within 30 days of the date of termination. Contracting authorities should be mindful of that time frame, particularly in circumstances where additional detail is required because the termination resulted from a breach of contract or a performance issue, as there's a lot more detail that needs to be included in the termination notice. Um, I'll come on to that in a bit more detail in a moment. So in terms of um, the contract termination details itself, um, all contracting authorities are required to give a reason for the contract coming to an end. Now, um, Section 80 sets out a list of potential reasons that could be used. However, it is made clear that that's a non-exhaustive list. So we've set out a few there on the slide. We've got discharge, which is essentially where potentially contractual obligations or deliverables have been fulfilled. Payments have been made and any disputes have been settled or potentially by mutual agreement or, or maybe even contract frustration. Expiry is as we would expect where the contract's reached its natural end. Termination by a party where one party exercises its, its contractual common law or implied right to terminate a contract. Rescission, probably less common, but a contractual, contractual mechanism where the parties are put back into the position they would have been before the contract was entered into. And finally, set aside by court order. We know now under the Act that set aside is the new name for ineffectiveness, essentially, but it is, uh, you know, a situation where the court might declare a lawful contract no longer effective. So, what is of particular interest, I think, to litigators is that in circumstances where termination occurs as a result of poor performance or breach of contract, there's a significant amount of detail, additional detail that needs to be included in the contract termination notice. So, for example, where an award of dam damages following a breach or failure to perform has been made or a settlement agreement has been entered into, all of that information needs to be included in the notice itself. It must include confirmation of the amount of damages or other monies paid and the basis upon which damages were awarded. So, for example, if that's in accordance with contractual terms, um, if it's as a result of a decision of the court or a negotiated settlement. There's also additional details we've set out on the slide here of explanations of the consequences of any breach and the impact on the contracting authority, steps taken by the supplier to mitigate that impact, or in a performance situation potentially, <clears throat> where, for example, um, the court, um, in a performance situation where they've tried to remedy the be breach, potentially why that breach and the steps taken by the supplier weren't satisfactory. 
So there's a lot of detail to be included in that notice. And interestingly, if damages are awarded or an agreed settlement is entered into after the contract termination notice has been published, the Act actually doesn't require the contracting authority to retrospectively update the notice with information regarding the damages or settlement. However, the guidance has made very clear that it would be good practice to do so. So that's potentially a loophole that's been closed by the guidance there. So moving on to the next slide, please, Jenny. What's the impact of all of this? So I think the most interesting point to take away from a litigator's perspective is that details of some settlements will essentially now be made public. So most settlements are reached on the basis of confidentiality and without any admission of liability on the part of either party. So these are some of the most attractive aspects of settlement in a dispute, which may now be impossible as a result of the contracting authority's obligations in respect of a contract termination notice. So the fact that the amount of damages or other monies paid and the basis upon which damages are awarded is now available to the market as a whole is likely to significantly change the dynamic of settlement negotiations in these circumstances. For how do suppliers approach settlement negotiations where the amount that they're willing to pay in a similar situation, for example, is available to the market? And similarly, you know, to the contracting authority with whom they're negotiating, equally for the contracting authority, the amount that they're willing to compromise a similar claim is also available. So both parties will be very mindful of setting precedents in that regard. Um, you know, what, for example, one can imagine a situation where parties approach settlement negotiations armed with details of other similar settlements that have been entered into and seeking similar amounts or concessions, as the case may be. So it's definitely an interesting point going forward in terms of that approach. In addition to that, there's also the possibility of an increase to FOI requests. Some additional detail is given. And if it sparks the interest of competitors within the market, we may see requests flooding in for more detail. And also, just as a final point, I think it's also worth noting to make sure that contracting authorities or suppliers, as the case may be, don't fall foul of their contractual obligations to effect termination correctly. There usually is, if it's under the contract, there'll be a separate notice provision to effect termination and provide notice of termination. This contract termination notice for the purposes of the transparency reg regime under the Act is not the same thing. And so you should make sure that you're also checking your contract if you're in a situation where you want to effect termination. Back to Jenny for final remarks. Thank you, Claire. That's great. Um, yeah, so it's time for us to, to, to finish. Um, um, when the webinar finishes, um, there should be a feedback form. So really, really grateful if you would um, complete that. Um, we will send around the recording and the slides and the Q&A document as, as soon as we can. Um, our next 5 and 25 is on the 7th of November, I think. And I think we are going to be looking at the implication of the Act for works contracts with some of our construction procurement law colleagues. So do join us for that. Um, uh, and of course, do also sign up for one of our in-person events via the a link, which I think is in the chat. Um, but that's it for today. I suspect there's going to be a lot of commentary in the procurement world today about the delay to implementation. But um, I hope you will have a lovely and no doubt slightly relieved day. And um, a big thank you from Claire, uh, from Adam and from me. Thanks very much. Bye.